4 ohm, 2 ohm, and the singles. The duals will make dual, you don't see too much dual 8 ohms anymore, but you see a lot of dual 2 ohms, dual 1 ohm, and then you've got, uh, yeah, that's about it, right? There. Yeah. yeah, okay. So what happens is, is you've got to figure out what impedance the sub's going to be. So if you have a dual voice coil, we'll just say this is 2, or four, dual 4 ohm, just for, just for purposes here. When you parallel them together, say positive, positive, negative, negative, that's a 1 ohm load. Okay? If you series them where you go positive, negative, and then you take the positive, and negative left on the voice coil the other side, so what did I say? It was two. So, so it's going to be a four ohm load. Okay? Now, you, so you either got to find an amplifier that puts out its max power at two ohms or four ohms. If you do a four channel uh, amplifier and you're going to bridge one half of it, it can only do a four ohm load. Does that kind of make sense? So you want to be able to match your sub that you're putting with. And then you got to look at what that amplifier is going to put out for power in order to run that sub. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that goes involved in it, so it's just not one brand's better than another. It's if you actually match it up right, you're going to get the max performance out of it. Does that kind of make sense? I know that's got a little tweaky technical there, but that's, that's the biggest thing that I see the misconceptions there is, oh, this driver's a lot on the other, and I guarantee you 99% of the time it's not the brand of the sub per se. It's going to be how it's designed, if it's got the proper, proper impedance matching along with the amplifier matching on the power. That's going to be the biggest case there besides enclosure where it's located and that type of thing. And then like I said, once again, going back to the interior of both speakers, that's probably, besides the cables, the biggest thing I see missing on a marine application is the inside both speakers. Um, you, do, you don't have to get up into four or $500 set of speakers, but you can get into, you know, um, a lot of these boats come with, um, you know, I know the Malibus, uh, the Mastercrafts are a little bit more money on the inside, but the Centurions, um, any one of those speakers that come in, those typically are like a $49 retail speaker inside the boat. So it's something to kind of look at and figure where, you, where you're going to be at. You don't have to spend a ton of money. You can get into a $150 range speaker, do four of them, get a small amp that runs them, which, which, which runs within the limits of the driver and you're going to get a lot more out of it and you get a lot cleaner signal. How, how about deck power versus amplifier power? What do you see there? There's, there's a whole bunch of different things there. De deck power works well, not for marine application in my opinion, because you're not going to get loud enough. Because what happens, you turn that up so far that you're distorting the signal, okay? And, and you're just not getting everything performance out of it. Any speaker out there will sound better with an amplifier. You get more headroom, you get more transparency between the music. Um, that's the big thing besides power to it to make that thing drive. If, explain dynamic headroom for us. Dynamic headroom is you basically got two levels here. So the way the headroom, <laughs> what? I get my own sound All right. You get your own sound <laughs> Okay. The easiest way, the most limited way to explain dynamic headroom is, is if you've got a deck and you've set it up to get your max power out completely all the way, you get from the deck all the way up and the gain's got to be all the way up. You, you have not conceived the potential of getting the most out of that speaker. You've underpowered the speaker um, from the head unit all the way down. When a deck, the deck has clipping. Any, any radio out there will clip, okay? You want to be about three quarters volume so you don't clip the signal out. Because once you start clipping the signal, the amplifier then feeds that clip signal and this in return clips as well and you get the distorted output. So what the headroom, what we're talking about headroom there is, is you want to be able to match an amplifier and head unit up so your deck's at three quarters level, your amplifier isn't cranked, it's turned back some, it's running efficient, it's going to run cooler, but it's going to put out the power. So you also want to look at amplifiers that have this RMS power. That's your biggest number we're going to get to. And that's where you're going to talk about the dynamic headroom. You can, so different music's recorded differently. iPod has been a very, very popular item, obviously. That is probably the best culprit to from my opinion, to make sure that you have some headroom there. And what that means is, is a lot of that stuff that's compressed music. So if you listen to your iPod, you probably notice you have turned things up a little louder. That's because it's compressed music. So by having some dynamic headroom in there as well, it allows you to have more flexibility of turning stuff up and down. But basically, dynamic headroom is, is you don't want to max everything out. That's bad. As much as people think that's great. It's kind of like hopping in your stock ready to turn the bass all the way up. Now you've just distorted the signal. Dynamic headroom it gets you the peak performance without everything not being maxed out into the clipping mode. That's basically what that does. Huh? That's good. It's good to know. I think, I think a lot of people just think turn it up. You yeah. Know, you well, you know, up, of course you want to turn it up, but you got you watch limitations of everything. You know, I wish there was a magic thing in our industry where 
uh, full volume was peak everything, but that would just never work, you know, because uh, you got different distortion levels and everything else that comes from manufacture. Um, God, was I going to think about the uh, amplifier? Hold on a second. In the middle of that, I was thinking of something else. Um, I'll have to get back to that when I think about it. Uh, so that's kind of the things you got to look for when you're, you're thinking about system design for, for your boat. You, you really got to look at um, a whole different aspects. I mean, it's a lot to, to incorporate, but you know, it, it's a lot of it's common sense, in my opinion. You know, you got power wire that's you know cheap, and you look in the inside, and there's no copper there. That's that's like driving a Ferrari around that's with a Volkswagen motor in it. It looks cool on the outside, but it doesn't give you the performance. So you really want to look for the performance. Uh, now on to tower speakers. Um, the way this critter, this critter came to be by several, several factors that came in there. Um, horn loader compressor driver, what that is, is in this one you can see a little bit better. It, this is your standard, kind of like a six inch driver, no tweeter in it, okay? The horn has actually got a diaphragm, there's a secondary magnet back here, which plays the actual levels, okay? Horn drivers, you'll see they're out there, and probably the most common thing is, is excuse me, RV like concerts, okay? Those big square boxes, and they've got the big flanges and stuff, the horns, okay? And the reason why horns are very well for concert speakers and things of that nature is they project sound far away. That's what they're designed to do, okay? You can get a horn to sound phenomenal. They have also a very tricky driver to make them sound good. Um, there's a lot of horns on the market that are amplifying mid-range vocals only, which is great, but after a while I start listening to it, the ear gets kind of fatigued because it's, there's no high end. There's no tweeter level. There's no smoothness in that. It's just all mid-range only. Sounds like an alarm clock to me at loud volumes, which you know, gets music out there, but you, can, you know, there's always that thing where things can be done differently. So a horn driver, like I said, it's just two speakers in the one. There's, it's a diaphragm in the back with a magnet, and that plays your upper end frequencies that comes out of the front. And the way that uh, the XM7s are designed is the grill's actually got the horn, what's your technical term for it? Horn the flange, flange, the yeah. flare, um, is designed in the grill, and that's a design process. So this goes all the way down into the base where the diaphragm, if you, can, if you guys can come up here a little bit later, you can see the inside of that. So that's, that helps the projection with the, with the flange there. And the way the exiles are tuned in is we did a lot of sound testing on these guys, and we really wanted to make it so it was a truly more of a natural sounding speaker instead of just nothing but mid-range only out of it. Um, and the other thing too is horns perform way differently on the water, just like any other speakers, but horns really amplify that on the water compared to on land, in a shop, in a garage, wherever you're putting these things on, they sound completely different in the water and they carry much further. Um, the other, the, and we'll talk a little bit more about the power thing once again because it's very, very crucial. If you underpower a horn, it is 10 times faster to blow than a regular speaker. They can't handle those distortion levels. You've got to have the power to make these things perform properly. You, you, if you underpower them, you will have a problem. Um, and they blow up in a very different way, and it's, I mean, it's almost in a way you take part speaker, you can tell if it's been underpowered or not, because um, the way it, it burns the voice coil on them. Um, so it's very crucial to get the right amount of power to your horn driver. So you need to look at the manufacturer specs. In any box, they'll give you a manufacturer spec, and you always want to look at the RMS. Don't worry about P, that's a marketing employee they all do, right? Okay. And lightning strikes. Yeah, if lightning strikes and the moon lines. It, yeah. So you, you want to make sure you look at all these uh, RMS value. And we'll jump back now because I remember what I was going to talk about amplifiers. Amplifiers are the same way. You see a lot of peak powers, not peak powers. What you want to look at is you want to look at, because they always give two SKUs, a 14.4 and a 12.2. Okay? A 14.4 is always going to show more power because there's more juice to give the current to the amplifier through the power wire. A 12.2 is the skew you want to look at, at the RMS power. That will tell you what that amplifier will put out at all times. Okay? And the way to think about that is, is if your car is running, it's sitting right around 12.2 to 12.6 at all the time. Now every now and then when you get the heater on stuff, the alternator kicks on way high. Okay? You always got those two levels of your alternator, they'll say like a 35.65. Well, 65 will be the max output okay? when that alternator is running full tilt. So uh, audio manufacturers always put the both in. Basically, you got to read through the ingredients and find what the magic ingredient is. And that's your 12.2 voltage 
at uh, 